Okay, we are right on time or a minute behind, so. Yeah. Okay, I, I hope I'm on. Um, Stan <laughs> Lieberman was teasing me about my comfortable shoes, and so we're doing some barefoot <laughs> lecturing. Barefoot, David Haig. <laughs> yeah. um, so, my talk is going to be not on what medicine can do, sorry, what evolution can do for medicine, but I'm going to talk about a fascinating phenomenon that exists in the medical literature for more than 20 years and in which there's been almost no evolutionary attention and may have interesting implications for evolutionary um, theory. So we're waiting for my um, slides. And this is the phenomena of chimerism. So chimerism refers to a situation in which um, within a single body, you have cells derived from more than one genetic individual, from more than one fertilized egg. Um, specifically, I'm interested in chimerism that comes about naturally in the process of pregnancy, so that in that placenta that Harvey Kleinman talked about, you have close interposition of maternal and fetal cells, and cells can move in both directions across that maternal-fetal interface. So maternal cells yes. can move into the embryo and colonize the embryonic, the offspring body, and correspondingly, fetal cells can move from the embryo's body into the mother's body and colonize the mother. So this is just a, an Etruscan bronze of the mythical chimera. As I've mentioned, a chimera is a phenotypic individual containing cells of two or more genetic individuals. Um, this is just a textbook picture of the human embryo implanting into maternal tissues and cells can be moving in both directions across this interface. The phenomenon has been around for a long time because fetal microchimerism, that is fetal cells in maternal bodies, have been found reported in dogs, cattle, rats, mice, and macaques. I should emphasize that these are cells at very low frequency, but this is a phenomenon that's clearly been occurring for a long time evolutionarily, and it's interesting to ask what might be some of the, what might these cells be doing adaptively, potentially? What are the consequences? So here is just some data I've got from the literature. These are blood samples from adult women and a woman's mother's cells were detected in 12 out of those 31 women. So those are the cells of the woman's mothers could be detected in their blood looking for the presence of non-inherited maternal MHC antigens. So these are antigens present in the mother but not inherited by the woman, but cells that are expressing those antigens can be found in their blood. Um, y chromosomes were detected, so cells bearing Y chromosomes were detected in most of the women who had given birth to sons. Um, data, particularly from Diana Bianchi, on this fetal microchimerism suggests that the engrafted cell populations persist for the remainder of a woman's life. Um, you can pull out, you know, 20, 30 years after last pregnancy, offspring derived cells from a blood sample from, from a woman. Um, it appears that once a woman's gone through the first trimester of pregnancy, even if the pregnancy doesn't come to term, that you can find those cells then in the mother's body for many years afterwards. Uh, here's an interesting um, paper. I haven't given you the reference, but it found that the num number of a woman's mother's cells in her detectable in her blood increase when she's pregnant. So these are the cells of the maternal grandmother of the fetus. Um, the fact that you have primary engraftment, so fetal cells are going into the mother's body and mother's cells are going into the fetal body, raises the possibility of secondary engraftment. Could a child carry cells derived from its mother's mother, from a maternal grandmother? Could a child carry cells derived from its older siblings? So those cells have gone into the mother's body. When she's pregnant again, could those cells then move from the mother's body into their younger siblings? And then the imagination can go wild. Could you know, a, a, an offspring be carrying cells from its mother's mother's mother, or its mother's mother, etc.? 
Um, could a child carry cells derived from its maternal aunts and uncles? And this starts to sound like microchimeric homeopathy, um, serial endless dilution. OK, so um, there is some evidence that, of microchimerism that can't be explained by primary engraftment from mother to offspring. And examples of this, why chromosomes have been detected in the blood of 20% of women without sons of five to six percent to pre five, five out of six prepubescent girls and seven out of 11 female fetuses. So where in these cases are Y chromosomes, so these are cells bearing Y chromosomes, where are they coming from? One frustration in the literature is that people just look at a single marker and nobody's done a, you know, you can isolate these cells using cell sorters in some case, nobody's actually looked at multiple markers and tried to identify the actual individual from whom these cells are coming. Um, so what, what could this mean evolutionarily? What are the, how is natural selection acting on these um, microchimeric cells? Now, and I'm going to focus particularly on fetal microchimerism in the mother's body. The first thing to say is that offspring fitness is enhanced by having a healthy mother. And therefore, negative effects of persistent offspring cells on a mother's fitness will be selected against. So you don't expect these to be having large negative effects on mothers, and if they can have positive effects, they should be selected for. Indeed, there is some evidence of tissue repair in mothers using fetally derived, um, naturally fetally derived stem cells. So benefits to a mother's fitness will be favored by natural selection, and as I mentioned, fetal stem cells can contribute in some cases to repair of maternal tissues. I, of course, being myself, am interested in situations where there's conflict of interests. Um, and there are suggestions that there are costs involved in fetal microchimerism. One particular area of interest is women have higher rates of autoimmune disease than men, unlike most other disease and the immune interactions that Molly talked about in pregnancy are suspected to have something to do with women's predisposition to autoimmune diseases. There is a suspicion, at least in some of them, that fetal some of those diseases, that fetal microchimeric cells in the mother may have some role. Um, but mothers and offspring, maternal and offspring interests diverge with respect to allocation of maternal investment among offspring. Sibling rivalry could potentially be expressed, that's competition for maternal investment, could be potentially carried out, expressed within the mother's body. Fetal cells could benefit their own offspring immediately after delivery by promoting lactation. And there are papers that find fetal cells are found after birth in maternal breast tissue, so they're in the right place and the right time. Um, pregnancy is known to protect against the development of breast cancer. And one interesting hypothesis is that fetal cells might promote differentiation of mammary epithelial cells during pregnancy to deliver more milk to the baby. And a side effect of this is that they're taking stem cells out of circulation and that's accounting for some of the protective effects of pregnancy against breast cancer. Um, infants would benefit from longer delays until the birth of a younger sib, and so you, you might expect fetal cells reducing the chance of the mother conceiving again. Fetal cells could benefit their own offspring by delaying the birth of a younger sibling, and persistent offspring cells indeed are present in the endometrium, so they're at the right place where embryos are implanting. Persistent fetal cells are also more readily detected in the blood of women who have experienced the pregnancy loss than in women who have not experienced a pregnancy loss. Um, some evidence suggests that this potential sibling competition may be more intense among brothers than among sisters. And here are some sex of older sibling effects from the literature. So younger sibs of older brothers have lower birth weights than younger sibs of older sisters, and this effect is most strong for younger brothers. 
Um, in women who have secondary recurrent miscarriage, so this refers to they've had a child, so they're fertile, they then have three or four miscarriages in a row, and sometimes they then conceive again. And in those women, the sex ratios before the miscarriage are male biased, and after the miscarriages are female biased. So that is consistent with a model in which it's particularly male embryos that are making it difficult for subsequent embryos to implant, particularly younger brothers. And of course, gay men have more older brothers on average than straight men. This is, um, you know, the popular hypothesis is the HY antigen hypothesis, but I wonder whether persistent fetal cells might be having some role in this effect. And so, if I have time, we could have some questions. Thank you. Questions? Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I was curious, when it comes to the uh, mother's and uh, cells being in the uh, next generation, obviously they're hanging around a long time. They must be uh, not fully differentiated because they keep replicating. Is there any, any reason to think about particular kinds of cells that are going from the mother to the uh, fetus, and any thought about what role the type of cell might play? Um. So the question is, what, what, what are the cells moving across? Um, and we, we really don't know. The easiest place to look is in blood, peripheral blood. And there you find, so hematopoietic stem cells are expressed. So these are fetal cells, so they are dividing. They can differentiate into immune cell populations. There's clearly trophoblast, which are the placental cells are moving into the mother. I wonder whether they can de-differentiate into stem cells and give rise to other cell populations. There are reports in the literature of fetal cells differentiating as hepatocytes or as thyrocytes in the thyroid gland. So wh whatever the cell population is, they in some contexts can differentiate into a whole variety of cell types. Yeah, we were um, discussing yesterday that we need some home runs in the field of evolutionary medicine, some examples of where the rubber meets the road, where we can actually show that evolutionary medicine makes a difference in clinical outcome. It strikes me that this would be a really nice example if we could figure out the right angle. In the field of oncology, when we're choosing uh, patients, donors for transplants and thinking about donors versus recipients, we pay very careful attention to how many children have they had previously and looking for mismatches, males, female children and offspring and so on. So it's not really a question, more of a comment that if we dig a little deeper here, this, like I said, may be the perfect example to actually show how evolutionary medicine impacts the practice of clinical medicine. 